It's my official voice. I'm just kidding. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I guess to start, we'll just introduce me and Sarah a little bit. My name is Alyssa Bowen and I am with Artemis. I've been an ambassador for gosh, about four years now. I came on in 2020. Uh, I live in Northwestern Oklahoma and I really love to hunt. I grew up fishing, but very recreationally. I would, I'm not any sort of expert. Um, I just rely on my husband for most of that, but I really love to fly fish, but I'm really interested in getting better and learning more about fishing. And um, Sarah is my fellow ambassador and she's a big time um, angler. And so when I decided I wanted to host this month's event, I was like, I would love to get Sarah on with me to, to get some experts. And so Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, I've been an Artemis ambassador for, I think, a year now. Um, I actually heard about it through the National Wildlife, um, Oklahoma Department of Wildlife sent out an email about it. And I actually watched, and I don't know if you know this, but the promotional video that Artemis did on with you in it. Oh, wow. Um, and that's what inspired oh, me to fly. So, oh. yeah. Um, but that's what inspired me because I, as a competitive angler. I love it, but I wanted to branch out and I wanted to do something different. And so I wanted to start hunting. And so that's something that I pursued this year. So I want to thank you, Alyssa, for providing awesome. me that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I fished since I was tiny. Um, I've competed for the last now 11, 12 years. Um, so I love to, you know, get out there and do the local tournaments. I'm going to branch out. I think next year, me and Michelle, hopefully she'll be my partner and we'll do LBAA and get out there and compete on a little bit of a bigger scale. Um, but yeah, so locally, it's just, I fish two tournament trails locally here in Oklahoma. Um, and then I run one of them and then I'll fish jackpots and, and things like that. So I really enjoy it. And then hunting this year was fantastic. So um, I ended up getting two during antlerless, um, my first ones, and I feel dressed them myself. And it was so, you know, it felt so good to do something new and achieve something um, as a new skill and give me some confidence in that area. So that's kind of how I came into it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to come over to your part of the state and, and do some fishing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'll take you out. I'll go out anytime. <laughs> do you want to go ahead and um pull up the slideshow or do you want me to pull it up or I got it. Okay. So were you about to say something, Sarah? Mm -mm. Okay. Um yeah, I guess we'll we'll hop right in. I think we have Latanya queuing up first, but um oh there's kind of some background. I may need to mute. Okay, wait, I, I don't think I'm echoing anymore. I just wanna make sure I'm not, okay. Um, LaTanya Blanding is up first. So um, for those of you who don't know, LaTanya is a competitive angler as well. She competes uh, major league fishing, uh, Bassmaster Opens, Fishers of Men, um, the Carolina Caroline Anglers Team Tournament as well. And so, Latonia, thank you so much for coming on today. We're so excited to hear about how you came um, into this world. Um, how did you get started? You want to start start us off there? And um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, fishing has always been something that's been part of what I do. You know, we, we grew up in a small town, Cypress Fort, in... South Carolina, nobody knows, hardly anybody really knows where that is outside of the general 20 to 30 mile radius of where we live. But when we were kids, our grandparents would take us fishing. We would load up the back of the truck, go down to the nearest little pond, fish, dig for our own worms. We never went to the store to fish for, um, to, to buy the wigglers or the worms or anything. So it was mostly pan fishing, like brim fishing, uh, catfish. I didn't know anything. I'm not going to say I didn't know anything about bass. I knew all about bass, but we didn't catch anything because I used to watch Bill dance as a kid. I remember Saturday mornings getting up and watching that show every morning. 
And now that I think about it, because I was so intrigued, like I was really engaged in that show and I did not want to miss it. And it translates now to just my overall passion for the sport. So fast forward years and years and years to where I am now. Um, I started dating Freddie Gamble, who is uh, who has been fishing competitively for 17 plus years now. And when I met him, he introduced me to bass fishing, the sport, the competitive side of it. I'm competitive by nature. I played basketball. I played softball. You know, I was involved in in sporting activities, and I just love the competitive side of anything. So when I heard about the tournament scene, I was like, okay, this is definitely something that I want to get into, something that I want to pursue. So um, I fished some local tournaments with him, the cat tournaments, the Carolina Anglers team trails. I started with those. We started with the fishes of men. And fishing with him, it was always pretty simple. You know, when they, when you got to use the bathroom, hey, I just hang it off the side of the boat <laughs> with him and, and we're good. But um, when I told him that I wanted to fish the um, the Phoenix Bass Fishing League, his thing to me was, okay, Tanya, that's that's fine and cool. But you're not doing that until you figure out a more discreet way to use the bathroom. You, you're not just <laughs> hanging it off the side of the boat. We we got to figure something out. So the whole time, I'm, I think for a year or so after that, I was trying to figure out, okay, what do, how do I do it? What do I need to do? And even myself personally, I just didn't feel comfortable. So my trick to that now is a baggy pair of pants big enough to where I can take a cup and put it in between my legs, spread my legs apart and, and use the bathroom. So, I mean, I'm really quick with it. I do it so fast. The guy that I'm fishing with doesn't even know. <laughs> Before he knows it, I'm dumping the cup into the lake at that time. So that's really how I got into the competitive side of it. But just fishing in general, it's been a love. It's been a passion. It's been passed down for generations. My great grandmother, my my family always say that I have my great grandmother's spirit when it comes to to that. So that's something that, you know, that I harvest in me, that I take, that I hold near and dear. So whatever I do and whatever I accomplish at this level, um, it's always going to be with her in mind and her spirit in mind and and moving forward just with the fact that they feel like that's who I am and that's who's in me. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that that's one thing everyone seems to have in common with the outdoors is that it is almost always brought to them by somebody that they love. You know, there's there's something about that that just resonates so deeply. So um, so one thing that I, I did see on the PowerPoint, whoop, sorry, I minimized so I could watch you talk instead of reading the PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, no, can you speak a little bit about where you are in your career right now and like how many weekends you compete a year? I, I really don't know that much about the competitive world in general. So can you just speak a little bit about what that looks like for you? Yeah, so I'm fishing the, the major league, major league fixing circuits, the Phoenix Bass Fishing League, and I'm only doing the South Carolina division right now. Within that division, there are a total of five tournaments a year that typically start around the February to March time frame. So this year, for example, we uh, we started out on Lake Hartwell. Um, then we came to my home lake, Santee Cooper. We did that in April. We went back to Hart. Yeah, we went back to Hartwell the end of April. And then we fished Clark's Hill um, May, I think it was. May or either June, we fish Clark's Hill. It's, the dates, everything is running together right now. And we have the super tournament that's coming up in September on Lake Murray. So right now, last year, so last year was my first year doing it. Let's let's just go back to that. 2023 was my first time fishing the major league fishing circuit, fishing on what I would call that next level versus the local tournaments that I was accustomed to fishing with Freddie. And out of the five tournaments that I fished, I caught six fish total out of the five tournaments. Um, the first one I zeroed, I think the second one I zeroed, uh, the third one was Hartwell. I caught two fish that barely weighed two pounds because they, they were small spots and hey, that's the limit. The limit is 12, 12 inches and a 12 inch fish, <laughs> y'all, you can imagine <laughs> a 12 inch fish is, is hardly even a pound. So you can come 
with your limit and not even have five pounds when you come to the scale. And that, that just blew my mind when I found out. I was like, are you serious? But in the major league fishing side of things, whenever you catch fish, even joining the tournament, you know, you get points if you participate. But every fish you catch, you gain points for every fish you catch. So even if there's no weight, even if you don't win the tournament, that consistency with catching fish will move you up the scale. So fast forward to now, 2024, so 2023, six total fish of five tournaments fish. My Right now, I think I have 14 or either 16 that I've caught because I've caught fish every single tournament that we fished so far. So I'm hoping to keep my to keep that going. I got one more coming in, in September on Murray. So if I can just catch at least one there, I am guaranteed to make the regional, um, which is on Lake Kerr in North Carolina. I'm ranked right now 14 overall. So I haven't had a top 10 finish um, just yet, but like I said, I've been catching fish and those have been valuable points, which currently have me ranked 14th. And it's the top 45 that get to participate in the regional tournament. So That's awesome. I'm excited about how far I've come um, when it comes to the competitive side of the competitive side of things. Last year, I think I got more so in my own way. I was so concerned about not getting in the way of the boater, not aggravating him, um, making sure that if he did catch something that I was netting his fish properly and not knocking it off the hook. You know, I hear stories about that all the time about how co-anglers go to the net of fish and they knock it off. So it was a lot of nervous tension for me that first season because I just didn't want to get in the way. I wanted to learn the ropes, but I was more concerned about not getting in that boater's way versus just fishing, which is what I've learned this year. This year, I do care about my presence on the boat. I'm respectful and I, I'm still not getting in that person's way. But at the same time, I'm more focused on what I need to do, which is I'm there to catch fish. I can't be concerned. I can't get caught up about how he's fishing or or her, um, what they are doing. I have to fish to my strengths. I have to bring in all of my techniques, all of the things that I that I recall. If I'm fishing deep, if we're fishing deep, if we're fishing shallow, what lures to use, what rod and reel to use, what setup to use, what baits do I think will attract fish? And that's my concern right now. So I think that's why I've been successful. I um I I'm very adamant about getting practice days in. Um, I don't like going to a tournament and have not had the opportunity to fish the lake. And people will tell me they was like, "Well, Tanya, you know, Clark's Hill fishes like Hartwell." Okay, but I've never been to Clark's Hill. I want to go out on that lake and I want to know what it feels like to catch a bass on Lake Hartwell. And yes, it does fish the same, but for me mentally. I have to build that confidence in myself to know that I can actually catch something on, on Clark's Hill, that I have caught something on Clark's Hill, to be able to go into the tournament feeling confident, feeling sure of myself, feeling certain that I'm not, I'm blocking everything else out. Your goal, girl, is to catch fish. So um, that's where I am now. This year will be my first year fishing the open um, tournament, and I'm only doing one in the South Carolina division and I'm fishing the Hartwell tournament that's coming up in October. So I'm nervously excited about that one because that's on a different level. You know, you got professionals on, on that level. So who knows, I might even end up in the boat with Scott Martin. And then mm -hmm. I might be so starstruck to where <laughs> I'm just sitting there watching him and, <laughs> and not fishing. But um, I, I doubt that that will happen, but I know that I, I would have to get over it just because I love I love the industry. I love the people in the industry. I love the connections that I've made through, with women, with female and men. You know, I was I was really intimidated about fishing on this level because it is a male dominated sport. You know, there, there's a lot of men. Um, even when I used to go and watch Freddie at the weigh-ins, I would see a few girls fishing as boaters, but it was no more than two that I would see. I would hardly see any co-anglers as females. So I, I was intimidated because I hear all the time, oh, well, what you doing here? I remember the first tournament I fished, I was in the store and I was looking at tackle and stuff. And the guy was like, you know what you're looking for? 
And I was like, yeah, I do. Oh, okay. And he told me, and I said, so what, what are you doing? You know, you're buying stuff, you're fishing a tournament coming up. And he was like, yeah, I'll be fishing a tournament on Santee tomorrow. And I said, okay, yeah. I said, well, I'll be there too. And he kind of just looked at me and was like, okay, but you're not really doing anything. And he didn't say that verbatim, but that's how I interpreted what he said. So my goal at that point was like, okay, I'm going to show you. <laughs> I'm going to walk across this stage. If I got to jump in the lake and grab some fish, I'm going to walk across that stage with something. Um, but that was locally. On the major league fishing level, every boater that I've had um, has been nice. They've given me pointers. They've given me lessons. They've, they've been coaching me throughout the entire tournament. And I haven't met one to this date that has been what a butthole. There's nobody that has just been like, oh, you're a female, you're a girl, you can't, you can't do it. Everybody has been very encouraging. Um, it still doesn't stop the stairs. I mean, even now when I walk across the stage, there's a little girl always sitting in the corner and with with just so much joy and like, oh, look, you know, that's me one day. But then you have the other, you still have some men that are looking at you like, like, damn, she caught fish and I didn't <laughs> <laughs> type thing. But right. you know, I try not to um, not to get too overconfident in that. I, I always want to be humble. I'm always thankful um, for the opportunity, um, you know, just being courteous, offering the things like offering gas money as a co-angler. You know, I do that up front. I don't want my boater worried about whether or not I'm going to run off and not give him anything for, for riding with him for the entire day. So those are the little things that I try to do up front just to keep the energy positive. You know what I mean? Even for myself and for him, because I've heard the stories of people that had co-anglers that didn't give them anything. And the co-angler themselves were just mean and not appreciative of the fact that you can't fish without this boater. And at this level, the boater can't fish without you. So you need to make that a compromise and you need to make it as comfortable. Have fun with it is, is what I do. That's awesome. Um, you've actually like answered a bunch of these questions we had on the slideshow already. You just were talking. It's just <laughs> obviously very natural. Um, but you had talked about, you know, the nervousness and um, all of that. So, and you, then I was going to ask you about, you know, being in a male dominated sport and then you just led right into that. So we can, you know, skip over that question that I had. Um, I, I guess the next thing, and you, and you kind of hinted this a little bit, but what are some additional challenges that you feel like you faced in getting started and, and being in this world? So right now, my biggest challenge is I own a boat, but I don't have a vehicle to pull it. <laughs> oh no yeah so don't um <laughs> did somebody say something <laughs> oh look <laughs> i said something you, you don't have a vehicle to support your boat so yeah right you so you know i i it was a, I, it was impulsive i wouldn't say that it was impulsive it was an impulsive decision um when i bought my boat i was actually just looking for a john boat something that i can pull with my forerunner that I can just go to the local streams or whatever. And um, one of my coworkers said, hey, you should go check out this boat that's, that's right down the road here. So I did that. And it was, I think it was a 2007 Ranger, older model, but immaculate shape. I mean, this, this boat looked like it had never left the showroom floor. And <laughs> um, he started getting into, you know, what are you doing? Why do you, you know, why are you looking for a boat? And when I told him that I was tournament fishing, he was like, hold on, let me show you something. So we go into this, this huge manufacturing warehouse. And I call it manufacturing warehouse for their business because he, he's, uh, he's an engineer. So we go into this huge warehouse and, you know, you got big lights flashing, big lights on the top. Everything is shining down like really a showroom floor. And when I, when I went around the corner, I saw this. Heaven is what I saw. I mean, my <laughs> heart just started beating real fast. My eyes lit up like a kid in the candy store. It was a black ranger with green, lime green trim. And I was like, that's it. I didn't even ask him how much it cost. I just said, that's it. That's the one I want. And he was like, are you serious? 
And I said, yeah. He said, well, I, I haven't even had it a month yet. And I said, well, you're showing it to me like you want to sell it. So what are you doing? <laughs> and he was like, okay. I said, well, can you give me a price? You know, let me know. So that's how that went. And honestly, he wasn't prepared to sell it. He was doing some work on it. He had gotten the boat effect. So he got the lime green uh, trim. He got the lime green cover on it. Um, the step, um, what do you call it? The trick step. He got one, of, he installed one of those on it. He got the lime green uh, letters on the side for the registration. And um, when he gave me the price and I came back like a week later with the money and he was like, okay. Like she was really serious. And I said, yeah. So when it picked it up a few days later and um, he called me that, he called me Monday. I went, I think I picked it up on a Friday. He called me Monday and he said, um, he said, hey, um, you do you want to give it back? And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, my wife is going crazy because I know the boat. <laughs> And he was like, I don't understand. And he said, I told him that that you were interested, that you were going to buy it. And I guess they didn't think that you were serious. And now that I don't have it, he said, they're freaking out. And I said, listen, if I ever decide to sell it, you'll be the first person that I call. But that's not going to happen no time soon. I'm sorry. This is what I want. This is where I'm going. <laughs> so oh. at the time, my forerunner was sufficient. You know, I pulled it to the lake maybe two or three times in the forerunner. I could hear the struggle, though. It's a V6. The Ranger that I got is a 521L. It's a 2019 521L. That is a long boat. It is heavy. That's a lot for a 1999 forerunner with 400,000 miles on it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so finally my forerunner died. <laughs> oh, no. I'm stuck with a, with a boat and um and no vehicle. Oh, but no. hopefully I I will get that resolved pretty soon. But um, outside of that, that was just a little funny for me to add to you guys. But um, it's my my challenge right now is getting to a level of comfort where I can enter tournaments as a boater, and that's what I'm trying to get to. I'm I'm not trying to be a lifetime co angler. That's that's not what I want to do. That's not what I'm aspiring to do. But when I transition to that boater phase. I want my I want to be able to catch fish as well as my co-angler. I don't want to handicap anybody that's on the boat with me. We're together, even though we're not fishing together as a team, but we're on this boat together. And as, as much as I want myself to succeed, I want the same for you. And right now, I'm not ready to take somebody else. I'm not I'm not feeling I'm not getting a warm, peace, fuzzy feeling with being OK with taking somebody out, not really knowing the spots to go to, not really knowing where the fish are. So learning the lakes, um, whether it's Santee, my home lake, which has a lot of stumps, by the way, if you ever come to Santee, please be careful out here. Follow the town of Marcus is the advice that I can give you. Um, you know, Hartwell, Lake Kerr, Lakes in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, I have to be comfortable with, with maneuvering, with navigating that and getting myself to a position of comfort where I know that I can catch fish and my co-angler can do the same. That's awesome. Can you speak to advice you would give to beginners who are looking to get into the competitive space? So um, just like I mentioned there, the support system, you have to have, I, in my opinion, um, it's critical to have a, a good support system. You know, somebody that understands your passion. Um, for me, people, people didn't understand or they didn't realize, you know, how passionate I am about this thing because they never saw that side of me. With social media now, you know, I get to post and I get to, and I get to let the world know what it is that I enjoy and what I love. And, and it is surprising by some people because they look at me and they was like, there's no way that you're fishing. You're not touching a fish. You're not touching a worm. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. But yeah, I'm, I'm a born and raised tomboy. I baggy pants, baseball cap. I got a hat somewhere sitting right here beside me <laughs> right now. You know, the, I've, I was never, I had doll babies, but my mom bought my, bought my brother a pool table for Christmas and I thought it was mine. <laughs> 
threw the doll baby to the side because I didn't want it. So I'm, I'm a tomboy at heart. I love being outdoors, but you have to have people that are encouraging you. You can't have the naysayers that are saying that you can't do it. Um, why are you into this? You're too old. You're too young. It's male dominated. There are not a lot of females. You're not going to get far. You got to have people in your corner that have the same vision that understand. And even if they don't understand it, because they love you, they support you in what you're doing and they give honest advice, not based on their fears, but the direction that you want to go. Um, connecting with other people in the industry. That has been critical and, and very important for me to connect with with men and women in this industry to learn as much as I can from them, um, practice getting out on the lake, going to the expos, meeting and connecting with other people. Um, I'm going to Outcast. I mean, ICAST next week. Talk about Outcast. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> ICAST next week. <laughs> And I'm I'm really I'm nervous about that, but I'm so excited about that because I know that there's going to be a lot of opportunities that come as a part of me participating in that event. Um, behavioral patterns of fish, there there's just a lot to learn. Like you never, in my opinion, you never stop learning about fishing. You never, there's never anybody out there that you can look to and say they know it all. There's there's always something new. There's new technology coming out all the time. There's new ways to to fish. There's new lures. There's and the fish are getting smarter. I mean, I I don't I believe that. I don't care what anybody says. Animals adapt <laughs> just like we do. So <laughs> you have to keep evolving with with times with with technology as technology changes. But remember the foundation. Remember the basics. Remember the basis on where you started from. And I think that'll take you a long way, but be open to learn things, learn new things. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I think they're going to be for both of you. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to Heather, and then we can come back to those questions um, at the end, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, but yeah, next we're going to have um, Heather broom sorry i'm gonna pull up the there we go um she is joining us from north carolina we have the carolinas here today so south carolina for latonia and then north carolina for heather um and and i'm sorry if i don't use all the correct lingo when when we're talking about this like i said i'm not an expert in competitive angling um, by any means um but heather competes on the lbaa women's pro bass tour um she finished first in 2023 Oh, I'm going to butcher this name. Can someone help me? What lake? Chattoo. Ch yeah. Chattoo. Oh, okay. Well, Chattoo. Okay. There you go. <laughs> First place, uh, 2024 on Lake Guntersville. And then fourth place, Angler of the Year. So, Heather, thank you so much for coming on today to talk to us. Thank you. This is fun. Um, Latonya well, is going to be kind of hard to follow up there. She <laughs> held everything for us. Um oh. So yeah, as far as how I got started, um, kind of like Latonya was saying, I, I grew up on Lake Chattoog. Um, I didn't necessarily grow up on Lake Chattoog fishing. I went with my family there and and water sports. If, if the truth be known, I, I lived to go out and, and ski and, and play in the water and boat ride and swim and that kind of thing. And, and of course, you know, my parents, my dad, he fished some and we'd brim fish from the banks and have, you know, we caught them little tater chip tournaments. So we had a good time with that. But as far as truly loving to go fish, I mean, I did it some, but it wasn't necessarily my passion at a young age. I mean, it was more about a passion just being at the lake and on the water. Uh, so as I got older, uh, out of high school, college age, trying to figure everything out, uh, my dad pretty much sold our runabout boat to buy a bass boat, and that just tore me up. I mean, that was just the worst of worst things you could possibly do. <laughs> um, but of course, I was I was living my life, doing my thing, and and he got into bass fish and loved it. Um, and so then a few years later, they went to the um, the 1994 Bassmasters Classic, which was in Greensboro. Um, asked me if I wanted to go with them, and and truthfully, I wasn't real crazy about it, but okay, here we go. 
uh, and got there and honestly fell in love with it. It was just, um, if you've ever played sports and watching the competitiveness when the guys weighed in, um, just being around the camaraderie of it all, it was just, you know, just a really cool deal. Um, so you couldn't help but to not kind of pull for everybody and get a little involved in it. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I met uh, my husband and he fished, uh, went out and just did the local tournament thing. And so because he had a boat and was on the water, I was, you know, there was, I, I loved it. Um, and would catch myself on, on the lake with him and not really caring so much about the fishing part, but he would catch a fish and it would just intrigue me to be like, a, if he can catch him, I can catch him kind of thing. Um, so started learning more and more about it with spinning rods. You know, I didn't know that much spinning reels and rods and know much about bait casters. And, and I have a very patient husband of 28 years after all this. <laughs> he, he's taught me a lot and put up with a ton. Um, but uh, I started getting intrigued with that. And, and I'd fish a little, you know, the local jackpots like Latanya was talking about. We would do those things and I would fish with him. And uh, so back in the day there was bass and gals um they had a tournament trail they ran uh and really more than just knowing that i knew it was women that fished uh at those classics you would see people like um emily schaefer penny Berriman, and that was you know just a few of the girls you saw in a tournament jersey everything else was guys um so then the women's um bass master tour came about um and it had been running a few years and, and I caught on to it and listened, paid attention to it um, and followed it. They were fishing actually Lake Norman um, in North Carolina. And that same summer, that was when we were fishing South Carolina couples. Uh, and we had made the championship that was uh, it was in Old Hickory, Tennessee in August. Um, hot as ever. And so we get there and, um, you know, I don't even remember how many boats, but. 80 boats, all couples that had qualified. And you see a handful of women that are on the trolling motor running the front of the boat. Um, a couple of their boats were wrapped and they were wrapped with their name on them and their sponsors on them. And it was just, it was cool. Um, and it was kind of one of those things where I think your husband's like, well, you're not going to be in the front of my boat. You know, this is, this is my <laughs> boat. And I'm like, but there's girls doing this. Um, so anyway, that that kind of got me intrigued, kind of got me to doing my research and learning more and more about it. Um, and that year, I remember as I was following and the women's tournament uh, trail that year was coming to an end. I told him, I'm like, next year when they come out with their their schedule, I just want to be a co-angler on just one time. I just want to go see what it's like, you know. And he was like, well, you know, he's very supportive. Go do it. Um, so then when they they came out with their their schedule, their first tournament was Lake Louisville in Dallas, Texas. And somewhere between thinking I wanted to be a co-angler in one tournament, I decided, what the heck, let's do this. Teach me how to run this boat. Teach me how to be in the front of this thing. And, and I'm going to fish boater next year. Um, crazy, LaTanya, you did the best thing by being co-angler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did. 2008 in March, I... I loaded my boat up and I had practiced all winter long in the cold on all the lakes. Tanya, I learned on Kiwi, Hartwell, Clarks Hill, Russell, Murray. We've been to Santee. Uh, and I took off to Louisville and literally was just a bundle of nerves um, and went down there and and survived is how I call that whole first <laughs> uh, Zeroed. Came all, you know, that drive from Texas back to North Carolina is extremely long when you've zeroed both days yeah. and, and you're trying to figure out how you justify what you just did and how you continue to do this. Um, but anyway, got home, you continue to work. Um, it, it'll happen to me eventually, but one of my goals, you set many goals, you talk about challenges. Um, I don't know that there's ever a day that you don't go out on the water or that you don't compete in a tournament that you have a new challenge that that you find that you've got to figure out. So there's always, always challenges. Um, but in those challenges, I think for myself, I set those mini goals. And so one of those things when I came back from Louisville was I sat there and I got to watch, you know, 88 other anglers that had made the cut 
or had caught a fish walk across that stage, tell their story. Um, and so to me, I was like, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to walk across that stage and tell my little story for the weekend fishing. Um, so my goal from that, that day forward was don't zero, you know, because if you zero, you get to sit and watch. Um, but even if you've got that 12 inch bass, you're going to walk across stage and you're going to get to thank your sponsors and you're going to get to talk about your day. Um, and to this day, that's not happened. I probably just jinxed myself. Um, but I have had tournaments where I didn't do well, um, tournaments where I wasn't satisfied, where I wanted to do better. Um, so that's where my mini goals come in and you keep working a little harder um, to, to go along with me learning to fish the, the boater side. Um, and there's just so much that I still to this day learn. But my husband also fishes. And so he competed um, in the South Carolina Savannah Series. He would fish the BFLs or the ABAs back then. And I would link. And so when I would link with him, um, that gave me the opportunity to go down and fish water that maybe I didn't know well or didn't know that much about and learn so many new techniques and and what you find is you discover what baits um what techniques what um, types of water that that you have confidence in and that you love to fish um and so as it turns out i have kind of become that uh, i'm a shallow water angler but i love that those heron lakes that you can fish uh, deep out over cover and that kind of thing. And you can quote unquote, call your fish up. I love doing that, but I also love to flip shallow. Um, so when Steven and I go out and fish a tournament together now, uh, we don't argue that much, but we will definitely disagree <laughs> as to where we're fishing. He's wanting to go dirty and shallow and I'm wanting to go clear and deep. And, uh, and you got that on our lakes in North and South Carolina. You can, you can pretty much go fish, fish your, your abilities there and uh so it's fun so yes the co-angling side is awesome because you never know what to be quote unquote prepared for you know you don't know if you're going to be fishing slow and on the bottom if you're going to be cranking working top so you only have the opportunity to take out you know four five six rods whereas your boater can have 20 and so you spend a lot of time trying to adjust and and so when that becomes a challenge and uh so anyway, over the years, my, I guess my biggest, um, if I could give advice for someone who is fishing, knows how to fish, but you're out there trying to compete. Um, if you've, if you've developed what you feel like is your strength, um, a couple of baits that you just feel like you can go out there and catch fish on any body of water, any time of the year, fish your confidence, you know, go out there and, and fish it, is it going to always catch fish? Not necessarily. But if you're fishing a lure or something that that you don't have confidence in, then you're out there, you're throwing and chunking and winding. And sometimes I just don't feel like your mind's in it because inside you're thinking, well, if I was throwing this, I'd probably be catching fish. Uh, so fish your confidence, Bates. I think that's huge. Um, that's a and- great um, tidbit for life in general, I think. Fish your, fish your confidence or just live your confidence, you know, that's, I like that. And the nerves part of it for me, um, when you first start, when are you not really nervous? I mean, I'm, I kind of get nervous just coming on and doing this tonight, you know, saying the right thing <laughs> to what yeah. people hear. Um, it's kind of like playing sports. If you're not nervous at, at tip off or whatever, you know, the first pitch, then, are you really passionate about it? So, so I think I always have nerves to a degree, um, but having confidence in what you're doing. So for me, it's as a boater, um, I need everything to be ready and, and prepared. And I probably, I'm not going to have a whole lot to say to you until that part of it's done. So in the mornings, it's making sure that I get the boat back in the water unhooked. Um, if all that's good, you know, did it crank? Are all my lights on? You know, is all my equipment the way it's supposed to be? And then that takes another little little bit of the edge off. Um, of course, you know, when you when you start off and your first run, if everything works out good when you get to your first hole. So there's there's a little checklist that I kind of have in my head. 
And once all those are checked, then I kind of relax enough and go out there and just, you know, start fishing your strengths and, and hopefully your day pans out for you. But, but yeah, that's the nervousness. I don't know that you ever truly get over the nerves. You just learn to get confidence in what you're doing. So the nerves aren't quite as bad. Mm -hmm. That makes sense for sure. Can you speak? And this was one of the questions I was going to ask, but just seems like a good time to throw it in there. Can you two speak for those who may not know fully about the, how it works, the, the being a boater versus co-angler. And like, if you were going to be, um, entering a, a competition, like, do they match you up or, or what are the roles there? I guess. Exactly. Um, I think it's the same. I think Latanya and I think pretty much all the rules are the same there. Um, in, in your draw tournaments, you'll have registration, uh, at least for the way the women do it and the way it used to be for, you know, like the BFLs and that kind of thing is, is you'll have so many boaters sign up. And so if you have 50 boaters sign up and you have 50 co-anglers sign up, then at the meeting, um, it's pretty much just a computer draw. So they'll let you know at registration, uh, who your boater has drawn as a co-angler, uh, you get their numbers and you, you either get their emails and you talk back and forth about, you know, the times you're going to meet. Um, for me, I try to give them a little bit of an idea of the type of water I'm fishing, um, the baits that, you know, you don't want to give them all the information, but you want to help <laughs> them so that, yes, if you're fishing 20 foot of water, they're not bringing something to fish five foot of water and and you do want them to be successful and catch fish. So, so you kind of exchange conversation there as to what you're doing. Um, kind of let them know what they need to bring. You know, if you, as far as, as I go, boater wise, I always make sure I've got plenty of ice and plenty of waters for them. And then anything else they want to, to bring is up to them. Um, and I think, is that right, LaTanya? Is that the way with the, the MLS is growing? Yeah, yeah, it's it's essentially the same thing. Um, we, I, my boyfriend and I, we link so with each other because he's fishing as a boater. Um, that's the only way that you can guarantee your your place in the tournament if you actually link with somebody. Um, so we have that covered for for every tournament that's coming up. Uh, but when the the draw is random, it is a random draw. You have no idea who you're going to be with until. The, the night before, so 6 p.m. on a Friday evening, we jump on a call with the tournament director and he gives us all, you know, all of the rules, the in and outs, whether or not it's going to be a trailer to weigh in or not, um, the limit, the times. So you, you get a text message with your boater's name and phone number. Um, I don't know, this must be an, an unwritten rule or something somewhere, but I have never had a boater that called me. It seems like I, as the co-angler, always have to call my boater. And my boyfriend is the same way. He will not call his co-angler. It's like he just sits there and he waits for his co-angler to call him. And I'm like, why are you waiting? Just, <laughs> you know, like, what, what, what is it with that? And, and I don't get that. But whenever I do make that phone call, um, I don't want them to feel like I'm probing for too much information. But it's more so for me because I don't want to get on their boat with seven rods. That's that's way too much to be carrying at one time. It it is it is frustrating when you're going when you're switching from one to the other, depending on how you're fishing and where you're going. Now my lure is tangled up in my line. <laughs> I'm frustrated because I can't get it out. Now the lure is caught in my in the leg of my pants because it came flying <laughs> off. You know, those type things that, that happen. So I've, I'm intentional about, hey, are we shallow? Are we deep? Um, just to get an idea of what I need to bring. For the, the struggle, and another struggle for me is that because my boyfriend does fish, there is also this, I think, perception that I think from some of the boaters that, hey, I'm going to tell him how they're fishing. And what I've found is that boaters don't normally change their mind based on information, based on doc talk is what they call it. It doesn't matter. You, you can tell me, but he's not going to change what he's done and what's worked for him in practice. He doesn't know your spots. You're not giving me waypoints. You're not giving me, 
um, the longitude, latitude, and degrees of of where you're going to be fishing. So that is um that is something that as well that is in the back of my mind. Maybe they're hesitant about telling me. So even if they don't tell me up front, because normally they'll start off with, hey, well, we're going to meet. We're in the first flight. I'll be there at five o'clock. Hey, can you back the truck down? Yes, I can. I can do that for you. So, um, and that's it. And if they try to hang up without telling me something, I'll be like, oh, by the way, you know, how, how are we fishing? Are we shallow? Are we deep? And that's where they start talking a little bit more. And I let them know why I'm asking. I was like, look, because I don't, I really don't want to get on your boat with all my rods and I got 10 of them. So <laughs> that's how that goes for, for us. But yeah, Heather summed it up for the most part. And I'm just doing a whole bunch of talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Heather, I was going to ask too, um, Latani spoke about this a little bit from the co-angling side, but have you, I guess when you as the boater are fishing, are you primarily fishing with other women or are you ever fishing with men that aren't your husband and how do they react to having a female as their boater if that's awkward I don't know so yes of course right now I'm just fishing the LBA so I am fishing against women um but in 2010 uh the WBT ended um the first year they let us know that that tournament was no longer um going to happen and so several of us had already planned for the year and um, was kind of prepared with our sponsors to go. At that time, um, the ABA, since we were doing the couples thing, being in Western North Carolina, they offered me to fish the uh, ABA East Tennessee, uh, I guess, division that they had. And they did that to kind of promote that area because they weren't drawing that many anglers. Uh, and then... So that was a way for me to get my entry fees paid and go on that side and fish. So yes, the first tournament um, that year was on Gunnersville. Uh, I think it was the end of February. And the first morning of the tournament, there was a delay because it was 24 degrees. And I was one of um, 128 boats and the only female, both co-angler and boater. So I have wow. been on both sides of that. Um, so a little bit of intimidation there as well. Um, but you're just one of the boats and you have to kind of have that mindset when you go out there is that, you know, you don't want to be rude. You're out there to do your job. Um, but you also don't want any of the guys to walk all over you either. And I promise okay. you won't find that. Uh, Latonya talked about that. The guys are the greatest. I mean, you may have one here and there that's, that just maybe don't care for the females to be there. But these guys are supportive. Um, you make friends with them. When I ran that trail, there's a lot of those guys that they knew I was fishing, you know, all the tournaments that year. So if I needed anything, I knew I could go to them. Um, no different than when you're fishing with the girls, you know, different ladies. They have um, diff different things that they can do. Thing, you know, some of them are good at changing a tire or working on your trolling motor. So we all have our little pros and cons and you learn who you can depend on, who you can. It's the same with the guys. They're great out there. But but yeah, um, with the guy, the intimidation part, you, know, you just, it's, it's no different. You go out there, those fish don't know that you're male or female. Uh, you fish your strengths. And and I know Latonya was talking about the restroom thing. I just think I kind of go over that. First thing when I get in the boat with them is, hey, we're here. It's, it's probably going to happen at some time today. You got to go where <laughs> I'm about to go. And, and so for us, uh, yeah, I, I sit on the side of the boat. Latonya was talking about that. I used to do the cup thing. I'm over all that now. I'm like, you know, you turn your head that way. And, I'm <laughs> coming, and if you've got to go, I'll turn my head this way. And we'll be done and keep on fishing. So, so yeah, it's it's fishing with the guys. I, I definitely have done it with other than my husband. And, you know, it's no different. I've had the opportunity to go out and fish with um, a couple of the elite guys over the years. Guys that have done really well from themselves. And, and you do have that, um, that starstruck part that you're going to go out there. Um, those guys fish just like we do. They have, they're on the water a whole lot more than we are. They have tons more experience. Um, they're doing this for a day-to-day -day living, but they go out there and they cast and they fish and they, they conversate just like we do. So it's kind of like just going mm -hmm. out there with another guy or girl and fishing. So. Awesome. Um, I don't want to take all the questions. Do we have any other questions from the group while we 
Oh gosh, we're getting very close to seven. So do we have any other questions um, from anyone? I want to ask um, advice for sponsorships. How have you, I mean, Heather or LaTanya, been successful with gaining sponsorships? That's a question that I have as well, because <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> so I'd like to hear Heather's um, response to that. So a little bit of feedback with me. When I first started doing this, um, was back 08, uh, 09, 2010, and I fished through about 2012. Um, during that time, I mean, getting a 100% paid sponsorship is almost impossible. I mean, if you have someone local that you know that, that has the money to put in to your tournament fees and that kind of thing, um, the biggest thing with sponsorship that I have found um, is that you're going to get product sponsors. You know, they're going to to give you discounts or free product and return. During that time, you pretty much worked boat shows for them. Um, you promoted them, tried to get their, especially if it was bait type sponsorships, you would try to get their bait into a local tackle store, um, promote them that way. Uh, fast forward to now. So I, I've had two girls and when they were young, I fished. And when they got to the age where they were playing ball and sports, I, I didn't give fishing up, but I gave the competitive side of it up for a few years. Um, and I entertained what they were wanting to do, playing, you know, doing their thing. It was, it was definitely something that was their time. Everything happens on the weekends. So like I said, I didn't tournament fish um, for a few years. Getting back into it last year, um, I fished a Chatoog tournament and ended up going and fishing their championship. And so I really didn't search for sponsors because uh, I was just kind of getting my feet back wet with it. Uh, so in 2024, this year, when I decided I'd fish it all, uh, I kind of jumped back in on the sponsor side of it. For fishing, I think big time, you've got to hit your sponsors up pretty much by October of the year before you're going to fish. I think that's when they're seeking their team and their pro staff and getting ready for their winter um, fishing shows, that kind of thing. So if you wait until the first of the year to start trying to find sponsors for the same year, um, you know, it's going to be hard. I'm not saying they're not out there, but I think it's much tougher because they've already got their team um, organized and ready to go. Um, and the big change for me, and it's something that I really, um, even like doing this Zoom right now, um, last year when I was approaching sponsors, one of the toughest things I found, and it was very humbling, um, is I would sit down and I'd write out, you know, what I could do for them, why I wanted them to sponsor me, um, where I could promote them, and you would... Um, you would think you had them, you know, hook, line and sinker, so to speak. You would be like, OK, I've got them. They're interested. They're asking me how much entry fees are. Um, and I remember this one sponsor. I mean, I, I was just confident that that I was going to you know, be putting their logo on my jersey. And the very last email I received from them wanted to know how many social media platforms I had and my YouTube channels and. And so a mom of two that hasn't done this for, you know, seven, eight years, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but am I socially active every day on social media? I'm, I was not. Um, and so that was the last I heard of them, you know, when I didn't have 5,000 followers or I didn't have a YouTube channel. So I think today, um, to answer your question after a long story there, one of the biggest assets you can have in seeking sponsorship is having that social media platform out there, you know, um, gaining the confidence to put your face out there, talk to everyone, um, grasp as big of an audience as you can. And I think that's, that's where your sponsorship starting to come from more so. Uh, so as far as, you know, that that's probably your sponsor, your fishing top sponsorship, go to ICAST next week and you should be able to <laughs> talk to lots of them. But, but I yeah. think local stuff, you're always going to have that that local tire guy or that local someone who who wants to see you be successful and may look at you and be like, hey, you know, put my name on your boat or my sticker on your truck and, and I'll pay your entry fees or something. But yeah. but it is hard. Um, one of the hardest things for women in landing a large sponsorship is most of us work for a living. Most of us are fishing 
on the side. Um, and unfortunately, that's what makes it tough for us is we're raising a family, we're working a job, uh, and then you're trying to fish for fun. And like this past year, I took, you know, four, I'll be taking five weeks off to go practice and fish and I own my own business. So I'm taking away from myself just to go and do that. Whereas if you were a full-time angler and a lot of your men are, you've got someone at home managing all of that for you. So it makes it tough for the women to plan those big sponsors like the guys can, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind I'm of getting this deep. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say <laughs> social media is new to me too. Um, I only got it when I joined Artemis. So it's That's new. Right. <laughs> you forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, does anybody else have any questions? I have a, I just have a minor question for Heather and Latanya, and it's just something silly. What's your favorite lure? I was going to ask that too, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mine, um, I would say is I, I love a spinner bait. I, I don't know why, but okay. I, I just do. Um, I love anything really that's moving, but my, my absolute just go to drop dead. If, if nothing else is working is a shaky head, okay. <laughs> something okay. I can drag on the bottom, take my time, go as slow as I can and just, and wait for that bite. But I, I would prefer um, something with some action, something vibrating, something moving, because I, I just want to, for me, it's mm -hmm. just something about reeling and just being in the element instead of just like just mm -hmm. sitting there waiting. It reminds me so much of how I used to fish when I was young and we just had the little pole out there with the bobber on it, just waiting to <laughs> no see patience. it go down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still, I want to, but what one of my challenges is that I'm, I think I'm just, I'm very limited right now. And I, I say I'm limited, like I've, I've fished a ton of different techniques, but the flipping the casting is something that I have to perfect, like for real, for real. I got to be able to get more accurate with the spots that I want to hit with skipping under docks, um, mm -hmm. pitching, flipping, all of that stuff is, you know, all things that I need to perfect. But definitely a spinnerbait is, is my favorite. I just, I like the way it looks in the water. You got all of those nice, fun, fun colors. Uh, my boyfriend will tell me all the time because I'll see something in the store with green in it. Green is my favorite color, y'all. If if it's got green in it, it's, it's got me. I'm buying it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Heather? What is your favorite? Oh, it's such a secret. Um, no, not really. <laughs> oh, my favorite. <laughs> my favorite uh, lore and presentation is a fluke. Um, oh. I, I will fish it. 365 days a year of course it's obviously going to work better um when they're chasing shad but just a little hint latonya those south carolina lakes love them uh, yeah. yes. and I'm, I, I, <laughs> said, I tried it down, so i tried it in my last tournament and it, it just was not working i i think i i don't i'm not quite getting how to work it properly for it to be successful for me yeah. It's definitely a technique and, and why I love it. I don't really know, but especially in our clear water, I love to cast it out there. Um, I swim it just a certain way. I call it dance and I'll tell my husband, if it's not dancing just right, it comes off. I put a new one on. I'll go through a pack of them in a heartbeat. But, um, but yes, I've just, I've learned to work that fluke. I, you know, I kill it sometimes. I burn it sometimes. And the fish will tell you pretty much the way they want it. Um, and you can fish it shallow. You can fish your own cover. You can fish it in open water. Um, if you're fishing a lake that's got grass, um, a lot of girls fish it Carolina rig. You know, they'll they'll take it down deeper. Um, but I pretty much fish it weightless everywhere I go, and and it's my go-to. It's my confidence. Okay. I like um, flukes a lot, and I'll do weighted or not. And I treat them almost like a jerk bait. I mean, the way you present it can be similar. Um, but I enjoy them. They're great. Yeah. Michelle, what's yours? I have two. I have, I have crankbait. I love, I have a 
particular crankbait it's got to have purple on it because latonia purple is my color <laughs> but um i also like a chatterbait um in top water i'm i'm a whopper plopper girl i i love that whopper plopper hit you know haven't been successful this year but i but i have three so chatterbait whopper plopper and and the crankbait with the purple it's got to be purple <laughs> Yeah, I, I just started um, fishing with the chatterbait. Um, the underspin was successful for me in my last tournament on Hartwell. And my when I when my boater actually asked me, he was like, "What are you fishing with?" And I said, "Underspin." And he looked at me like, 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 no, you don't fish with that now. But I was catching like I caught my limit <laughs> on there that, <laughs> right? And um, I think the tournament before that. The also uh, Berkeley has come out with the uh, the finisher. I mm -hmm. really like that. Like it's it sinks really quick, like like a torpedo, but it went. It it looks really really cool in the water. I I will say that, and it, and it does get it gets their attention because it it goes down like a missile. But you can fish it and you can constantly reel it, but with a little pop. Okay. And just pop it, and yeah, they. They love, they love on Hartwell. We have not had now the crappy, crappy love it or crappy, but we call them crappy. <laughs> <laughs> crappy love it. They love it on Santee. They they love that that finisher, like that little five or uh the number seven, the number seven finisher. Okay. With this my expertise. Fun. Yeah, I was just going to say my favorite is just a yellow spinnerbait. I, it's my go-to because I always catch consistently the biggest fish I've caught over my uh, tenure has has been with those. And so I just go to it just about every time. But I've been fly fishing for bass lately. And so I'm learning a lot about that. But um, I'll report back later. But that's what <laughs> I've, I've really gotten into lately. So, um, but That's yeah, something just, I want to learn. Oh, I, I really love it, but I think it, it's, it's good for me when I'm fishing with like a spinner rod or something. It's, uh, my husband says I cast funny. I played tennis. And so I cast like kind of from the side instead of over top. And mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't know. It, it works well, the, the fly casting. I like it. So it's a little easier on me. Gotcha. I'm a side caster too. So I always cast, you know, on the right. Yeah. That's right. And my okay, husband, so not weird. Time, yeah, no. Every <laughs> time my husband and I are fishing together, he always if he's if, if my husband goes down to change a lure or something, every single time he'll say, "Don't hit me, <laughs> don't hit me, <laughs> don't hit me." That's funny. Oh, now, have you ever hit him? Once, but oh. it did. It didn't stick. I mean, it Let's hit his go. hat, and he was fine. <laughs> It didn't hurt him. <laughs> oh gosh, that's funny. Oh man, I do have one more question. Yeah, um, go for it. How do you guys feel about? I mean, I think Latanya mentioned this earlier about new technology and stuff like that. Of course, I have to ask this question: uh, forward-facing sonars. What's your viewpoint on them and how they are used within the tournament realm? I'll go first there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it kind of, you see it go both ways. Um, I can see both sides of the argument. Um, I have both forward facing and perspective on my boat. And uh, I'll take, for instance, and I'm still learning a lot about it. It's no different than the social media platform and that kind of thing. It is a learning curve for a lot of us that have fished by, instinct or 2D sonar, um, you go down a bank or you're on the lake and you see some, you know, a log that looks really good and you cast to it, whether you get bit or not, this is a whole different concept of, of getting in deeper water and finding brush or finding whatever it is that's holding those fish that you never really had looked at or looked for or even fished before. Um, the technique side of it, yeah, I'm definitely learning tons and tons about just using um, your little ball head jigs and, and a shad minnow or that type of thing. Um, 
seeing it and trying to present it to them. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely going to take going out there and practicing, which I feel like on the tournament side of things that if you're going to get better and be successful at it in every tournament, no, I don't necessarily think it's going to be the win and key. Um, but I do think there's tournaments that are tough that it's going to help you maybe not win, but be in the top of the ball game there. Um, but I'll use Gunnersville for example, um, went down there and practiced and was finding brim beds. Um, and those brim beds were surrounded by grass. I was very, very shallow. Uh, and so when the sun was high and, and the wind was calm, I could see those beds. It was no different really than um, sight fishing. And so as I was practicing that week, um, we would have a windy day or a little bit of a cloud cover. A rain wasn't necessarily an issue, certainly could have been, but I was trying to find more and more areas that held this type of, um, of shell bed with the brim in them. And so by using my electronics, one day I just happened to be kind of looking and, and I'd zoom in on my Ford face and I'd see my grass uh, and I would see just what I what I felt like was a ditch um, or a tunnel, just a blank. Um, and when I would look at my my perspective, I would see these black holes, um, or at least that's the way it came up with the color and stuff that I had on my units. And in those holes, you would see white spots and that was your bass. So when I started comparing the two, I realized that I don't have to be visually looking at this stuff with my eyes to figure out where these beds are at. Um, I can see it here. So now if I look at my, my map, my GPS map, and I had my shallows, which was, you know, one to three feet colored in red. So I could zoom out on my map and where I could find those red spots, I knew where my shallow humps or back in a pocket, I would start running those and I would just get up on my trolling motor and go to looking. And if I couldn't see, I could look on my graphs and see. So was I necessarily targeting the individual fish like you see a lot of the guys do, you know, um, with the ball head jigs? Because I was just throwing a Texas rig worm, um, but it helped me locate. And when I would get in those areas, what I would do is instead of, you know, scaring the fish and stuff with my trolling motors, um, when I would see that area on my graph that was what I thought would be, you know, a bed, I would just put my power poles down and I could go to flipping and work in that and never really mess with the fish that much. So I am new to it. Um, that's just my example a little bit of what I learned this past tournament that's kind of got me favoring them more and more. Um, so yeah, I think as long as they're going to keep advancing technology and coming out with more and more stuff in order for us to be more and more competitive, that's the route we're going to have to learn and take. So, so yeah. yeah, I'm not against them or for them, but I don't think they're going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's the same for, I, and I, I'll just get the perspective of, of a co-angler. Um, I, I do have, I have the grass, I have forward facing sonar on my boat. I'm still trying to learn it. Um, what I'm seeing, how to interpret what I'm seeing um, understanding where your transducer is in relation to your trolling motor and what you're actually looking at so you know exactly where to cast. But when when you're on the when you're fishing that when you're on the boat as a co-angler and your boater is in a hundred feet of water with a ball head jig, forward facing sonar, and you're on the back, it's like you know, it, it, yeah, you don't have a shot at casting anywhere near because you don't see it. Is that right? Right. You don't see it. Um, you know that. And for the most part, they're probably facing it right there. So most people and, and a lot of as a courtesy, you know, you don't want to throw your your line over your boulder's head. Um you want to be courteous, but mm -hmm. the rules don't tell, the rules say as long as you're not impeding on him. So if my, I can cast over his head, <laughs> if my line is not impeding with his line, it's not, it's not wrong for me right. to do that. You know what I mean? But people, but you won't do it. Like I, I know that I can do it, but I won't do that. 
just because I'm not comfortable with doing that. I, I don't think I would appreciate it if somebody was doing it to me mm -hmm. on the back of the boat. But um, I do pay attention. If I see them scanning, I'm looking. Like, I, I really am. I'm, I'm looking at their graphs, and I'm seeing what they're seeing, and I'm basing my next cast off of what I what I was able to see on your graph. And that, that has been successful for me for, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm so fortunate and, and blessed to say that in every tournament I've, I've caught fish um, either by watching what they're paying attention to what they're looking at, or just the basics. If we're shallow, um, what, what to fish with, what lure, what bait to fish with, what presentation do I want to give them? I had to get comfortable with the Cinco um, this year, skipping that, you know, if we're fishing banks, skipping under some tree limbs and getting to that bank, I had to, that's how I caught the one fish I caught on Santee. Like, and it was the perfect cast. And I can remember saying to myself, I was like, oh my God, that's it. Cause it, it was a tree <laughs> limb, lay, it, it was a tree laying down um, there were some limbs around it, and I just took my my little spinning combo and I skipped that thing, and it was like right to the bank. <laughs> and I just sat there and I just waited for it. And I remember thinking to myself, "This has got to be one. This has got to be one." And the next thing I know, I see my little line doing this, like swimming up out of there, and and that was it. So you, it's a combination of paying attention. When you're on, when you're when you are a co-angler, paying attention to what they're seeing, what what you're surrounded by, and then also not forgetting the basics. So if I see there's a brush pile, you're fishing the tops of trees. Okay, what do I want to do? I may want to get something. I may want to pull that finisher out. That's gonna sink pretty deep. Count, do my countdown. Whether it's a five second count or whatever it is, if I see that, okay, fish are at. Because I'll even ask, well, how deep are they? If he's telling me, because they, they love talking. Oh, man, yeah, I see some. <laughs> I see some about, you know, 20 feet deep or whatever the case may be. But if they don't tell me, I'll ask, oh, like, oh, how deep are you seeing them? So I'll cast off to the sides and, and just do my countdown and then start reeling it in just to, to kind of give the same presentation so that I'm not truly handicapping myself or I'm not truly feeling like, like, oh, my God, you just set me up for failure. And I hear that so much. Like, I hear that from a lot of co-anglers. It's like, man, my boater was out in 100 feet of water fishing in top of some trees, and I couldn't do anything. Just keep your line wet, man. Keep the line wet. Keep something in the water and and fish to your strengths. Fish to, know, fish to what you know to do. Awesome. With what, what Tanya just said right there, as – as a boater to our disadvantage. And I think one of the things we get called up in is we get focused on what that forward facing unit is doing. And we're so called up in and catching them that way. So as yeah. a co-angler, it's really hard in a hundred foot of water, but chances are you're going to be able to throw a shaky head anywhere your boater stops at. And I have had my tail handed to me several times because I get too caught up in what I'm doing and I don't realize that, hey, there's fish all around me and your co-angler just dragging, you know, a worm, a Carolina rig, a jig, they will work on you and humble you in a heartbeat doing that. Um, and so the, the other big thing I know, and Latonya's right, usually I'll ask my co-angler if they want to graph on, you know, um, if I'm leaving them on, do you, do you want it on depth? Do you want it on map so you can see? Or And a lot of them know how to work the graphs anyway. So once I get up and I go to the front, you know, if they want to want to change pages or do something, that's fine. But I do think for a co-angler, the big thing is knowing your depth. If you know how deep you are, mm -hmm. if you know the depth is coming off of a slope or a ledge or, or a bluff wall. You certainly if you've got something that's going to stay on the bottom, you're going to be deadly just right there. And and nine times out of ten, your boaters going to be around fish or they wouldn't be there. So, right. The co-anglers, it's just like, like you said, keeping your line wet and being confident and just whether you hate that slow, slow drag. But I do think that's how a lot of co-anglers end up on top is, is dragging that shaky head or a worm behind them. Yeah, that's how I fished on um, on Clark's Hill. I, I, drug, I did not 
drop shot and uh, Carolina rig. Yeah. <laughs> and I know like I, when I'm up there and, and you're right with the forward face and a lot of times you're looking at whatever's right in front of you, unless you start panning, you know, right and left. The newest thing that I'm kind of seeing with that perspective is you do have that wide cone. Um, so I know a lot of times when, when I would be fishing, you know, I can't make six cast right here. So if I'm working on what's directly in front of me, I would tell them, Hey, you know, if you cast to your three o'clock or you cast to your nine mm -hmm. o'clock, there's fish there. Um, if you catch them, you catch them. If you don't, you don't. But I do think, and I've heard other co-anglers say that if they're with a boat or that has a unit that can give them, you know, their side scan or something, if you, if you'll, if they'll turn it on for you, you can definitely see if there's shad or something around trees or, you know, rock, a stump. And that helps you guys a lot too. So it is yeah. hard right there. Are a lot of adjustment that you have to do. Yep, it, it is. And that's, that was kind of what I was talking about earlier, because that's, I really was getting in my own way last year. You know, it was, it was my very first time fishing the BFLs. I got all of this stuff playing in my head and my mind. Don't get in the way. Don't aggravate your boater. Don't do this. Don't do that. And fishing with, somebody that fishes the BFLs, I hear all of the things that he complains about. And all of that is in my head. And in the back of my mind, all of last year, it was it was all of that. And I, I don't think I was able to relax enough to be confident enough in just in just fishing because that's that's what I'm doing. You know, and Heather was talking about nerves. Like, yeah, I'm I'm nervous every single tournament. When we take off, like you know, I'm just sitting there and I'm praying. I say a little prayer to myself. But when we get to that spot and I get up and I pick that that comp that um, whatever I'm fishing with, when I pick that up and I make that first cast, it's like, okay, here we go. It's on. Let's let's do it. Now, if we're halfway through the tournament, I don't have anything in the boat. Now I'm like, ah, <laughs> like, okay, girl, get it together. And I say another prayer, like. You know, just to just to calm my spirit, just to calm myself down and try to regain that confidence in myself and in my ability to be able to catch something. But also in that, I also say to myself, you know, if if I don't give it the best, give it the best shot that you can. Don't blame anybody else for your failure or for your lack of. Make sure you give it your all. If you give it your best shot and you didn't catch anything, yeah, you're still going to feel bad because you didn't catch anything, but it's, I, I didn't spend my whole time complaining about what my boater did. I did everything that I could possibly do to try to catch fish, and I wasn't able to. Yeah. It's what did mental. I learn from it? Oh, yeah. The mental side yeah. of it, you can mentally take yourself out of it, and you can mentally put yourself right back mm -hmm. into it. So you, you coach yourself all day long, or I catch myself doing that, you know, be yeah. fishing for two or three hours and you hadn't caught a fish or had a bite and you know they're there you so you just have to like you know talk yourself back into it they're there you've got to you got to figure out how to catch them so yeah absolutely so well, we'll tell you, the women oh. are at kiwi next january you just need to come fish with us i know <laughs> i saw that i was like oh look and then um i was talking to somebody about it and it was like oh It'll probably be snowing. <laughs> That's okay. Throw your buzz bait. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, you guys were almost an hour and a half in. So I think if we don't have any more questions, we probably ought to wrap it up. Um, but thank you guys so much. I feel like I learned so much. And uh, I just appreciate you uh, getting on here and sharing with us and, and, um, yeah, and Sarah and Ariel for for setting it up, and I'm just yeah, it was a it was a great night. It was great to see you, ladies. Yeah, greatly appreciate you guys having um, having us on. Me, I'm I was really excited about when Sarah reached out. I was like, heck yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> for all that. Thank you. <laughs> so well, thank hey, you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, you guys are awesome. I've been following both of you guys on social media and seeing your content and stuff, and so and stuff with LBA and all that. And I just appreciate you guys taking your time and I enjoyed it. Enjoyed hearing everybody. And um, hopefully next year I'll see you guys at a tournament um, 
And yeah, I saw cool. on the PowerPoint, Heather, are you going to be in Grove at, uh, in October? October? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's cool. Cool. But it is that would be cool. fun. I think yeah, all of my tournaments have been 12 plus hours this year traveling. Gosh, wise. So yeah. That is brutal. Wow. But Grove will be fun. And and the new guys, I'll, I'll plug them real quick. The new guys that have took over the LBA, they're doing an awesome job trying to promote us, trying to get more ladies out there. Yeah. So even, even if you don't have the confidence in fishing a boat, come fish co-angler with us. The camaraderie is great. Um, we're all out there to support each other, but we're out there to compete, you know, as well. So so just come awesome. come get a taste of it next year. I'm, he's starting to release the schedule. He's released Kiwi. Um, I think he's going to have six tournaments. I'm not sure where they're all going to be, but I think they're trying to gear it more towards, you know, you know, being from North Carolina. I mean, Latonya is probably six hours from me, um, even being in South Carolina. So, so they're trying to gear it to where you're not making these Texas travels, Oklahoma travels, Missouri travels. They're going to have some stuff a little bit closer and you pick, um, hopefully the way I think it's going to be set up is as you pick three or four of those tournaments, the to fish, and that goes towards your points, not having to fish all of them. So, so kind of keep up with it. And if I see things I'll post, but we'd love to have all you guys come be a part of it. I can't wait. Yeah. yeah we're going to ride together. Yeah. <laughs> <my voter. laughs> Okay, well, everybody have a great night and, and thanks again. And hopefully we'll see you down the road somewhere. All right. It was nice Thank to meet you, you Heather and LaTanya. Yes, you